Between the late 17th century and the harrowing climax of the Civil War in 1865, America bore witness to a somber and haunting chapter of its genesis. The breeding farms that flourished in the crucible of states like Virginia and Maryland remain a macabre testament to the profound dehumanization of an entire race. Can you fathom the anguish of mothers, daughters and sons, separated not merely by cold, unfeeling chains, but by the scratch of pens in ledger books and the harsh call of auctioneers' gavels? Robert Lumpkin, an infamous name etched in the annals of history, surfaced as a symbol of this unimaginable cruelty. His establishment, known as Lumpkin's Jail, located in the shadowy corners of Richmond, was notorious, not merely as a hub for the trading of human lives, but as a place of brutal subjugation for those enslaved souls who dared to resist. Amidst the fertile expanses of the southern states, sprawling plantations, the bastions of grandeur and opulence, were erected upon the broken backs and shackled spirits of countless enslaved individuals. While Cotton ascended to its throne as king, it wove a tapestry of prosperity for the white plantation owners, a tapestry stained with the sweat and blood of those who toiled under the relentless sun, their hands blistered and their souls weary. Names like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs, luminaries who escaped the chains of bondage, echo through time, their words a harrowing chronicle of the experiences of many, shedding relentless light on the relentless machinery and savage routines of the plantation system. Consider the chilling words of Solomon Northup. I was seldom whipped, save in the ordinary routine and regulation of the plantation, but the whip, nevertheless, was frequently flourished over my head. His account unveils the grim panorama of indignities and brutalities that were daily companions to the enslaved individuals. Join us as we navigate the grim annals of breeding farms and the relentless grind of cotton plantations, bearing witness to the stories of those who suffered and those who resisted. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. The mechanism that magnified misery, Eli Whitney's cotton gin. In the waning years of the 18th century, a curious, innovative mechanism was brought to life destined to change the fabric of American agriculture and deepen the shadows of an already oppressive institution. Its inventor, Eli Whitney, a young graduate from Yale, had traveled to Georgia in 1792, seeking to reinvent himself. It was here, amidst sprawling cotton fields, that inspiration would strike. Historically, cotton production was a laborious endeavor due largely to the tedious process of separating the sticky seeds from the cotton fibers. This made the cultivation of short staple cotton, the type that thrived in the southern states, economically unviable. For every pound of usable cotton, countless hours were expended, primarily by the hands of enslaved individuals. The inefficiency of this process meant that long staple cotton, which grew mainly along the coast and was easier to process, was predominantly cultivated. Yet its geographical limitations impeded the expansion of cotton farms. Enter Whitney's groundbreaking invention in 1793, the cotton gin, short for cotton engine. With its simple yet effective mechanism, the cotton gin could process 50 times more cotton in a day than a single worker. Suddenly, the agricultural landscape was transformed. Short staple cotton could now be processed at unprecedented rates, making its cultivation immensely profitable. As plantations expanded inland, Away from the coast and its long staple variety, short staple cotton became the beating heart of the southern economy. However, the unforeseen consequence of Whitney's invention was its profound and devastating impact on the institution of slavery. One might assume that a machine which automated the process would reduce the need for manual labor. Paradoxically, the opposite occurred. With the newfound profitability of cotton, planters rushed to expand their plantations. Larger plantations necessitated more hands, not for ginning, but for planting and harvesting. The demand for enslaved labor skyrocketed. Between 1790 and 1808, the importation of enslaved Africans grew exponentially, with Charleston, South Carolina, becoming a bustling port for this grim trade. Among the vast cotton fields, whispers of the cotton gin's impact became omnipresent. Frederick Douglass, the renowned abolitionist and former enslaved individual, 
would later reflect on the role of such inventions in perpetuating slavery. He remarked, the white man's power to enslave the black man grew out of the very progress of the nation. Douglas's words underscored the tragic irony. An invention meant to progress, the industry deepened human suffering. Anecdotes from the era further illuminate the gin's impact. It's said that when Whitney showcased his machine, spectators were left awestruck. In mere minutes, the cotton gin accomplished what would have taken hours by hand. A spectator supposedly exclaimed, Gentlemen, there is the king that will rule the South. And indeed, the gin became a monarch of sorts, with cotton as its kingdom and enslaved individuals as its unwilling subjects. A curious twist in Whitney's tale was that, despite the cotton gin's immense impact on the economy, he made little profit from it. The design was simple and easily replicated, leading to widespread infringement on his patent. Legal battles consumed much of his time and resources. In one of his letters, Whitney lamented, I have not received one cent for my invention. Yet, the lack of financial gain for Whitney was an insignificant footnote in history compared to the societal ramifications of his invention. Sowing shadows, the dark harvest of slave breeding in America, in the vast landscape of American history, there lies a haunting grove where humanity's most chilling tendencies took root, the practice of slave breeding. Beyond the fiscal calculations and profit margins, the essence of this brutal system was a profound personal intrusion. It was a perverse dance of power, economics, and systematic cruelty, choreographed to the whims of an insidious market. In the twilight years of the 18th century, the initial flow of enslaved Africans to the American colonies had begun its slow, albeit forced, ebb. With the act prohibiting importation of slaves of 1808, importing enslaved people from Africa became illegal. But the demand for labor, especially in the sprawling cotton fields of the Deep South, did not wane. Instead, it transformed, turning its hungry gaze inward. The focus now shifted to an internal propagation mechanism, wherein the existing enslaved population would be coerced into increasing its numbers. Virginia, which boasted one of the highest populations of enslaved people in the early 19th century, soon earned the morbid moniker of the breeding state. Infamously, Robert Lumpkin, who ran the notorious Lumpkin's Jail in Richmond, not only oversaw the sales of countless souls, but was also implicated in this breeding practice. His jail, often referred to as the Devil's Half Acre, bore witness to immeasurable sufferings, including the forced couplings and family separations inherent in slave breeding. There are accounts, like that of Harriet Jacobs, an escaped slave who penned the autobiography Incidents in the Life of a Slave Woman. Harriet detailed the lascivious attentions of her master, Dr. James Norcom. Her narrative provides a window into the lives of countless women whose rights were infringed, not out of lust alone, but as part of a cold, calculated economic strategy. Norcom's obsession with Jacobs, driven by both perverse desire and the prospect of producing more slaves, made her life on his estate a living nightmare. The letters of Mary Chestnut, a southern planter's wife, offer another perspective. In her writings, she noted the disconcerting sight of white slaveholders surrounded by multiracial children, unmistakably their own, yet bound in chains. She wrote, Like the patriarchs of old, our men live all in one house with their wives and their concubines, and the mulattoes one sees in every family exactly resemble the white children. It's a chilling testimony to the open secrets of plantations, where forced unions produced children who, despite having slaveholding fathers, were condemned to the shackles of servitude. Curiously, slave breeding was rarely discussed overtly in public discourse. It was like a spectre, everyone knew of its existence, but few dared to acknowledge it out loud. There were, however, oblique references. Advertisements in newspapers selling breeding women or wenches were not uncommon. Their coded language belied the tragedy these simple words encapsulated. Anecdotes abound of breeding farms, where the most virile men and fertile women were paired, often against their will. Young women were subjected to systematic violence to ensure they bore children early and frequently. Families were torn apart, not just by sales, but by this practice as well, 
with fathers, brothers and husbands powerless to protect the women they loved. When white gold ruled the land, the dominance of King Cotton, in the redolent tapestry of America's past, few epochs stand as stark and transformative as the age when Cotton reigned supreme in the South. As the 19th century dawned, this seemingly unassuming crop began its ascent, weaving a path of both prosperity and sorrow, firmly establishing the South as the world's cotton kingdom. Long before Wall Street's titans, the lords of the southern lands strode with a confidence born of the wealth that lay rooted in their fields. But this tale begins not in the vast plantations, but in the bustling textile mills of England. The Industrial Revolution, roaring to life in the late 18th century, had an insatiable appetite for raw cotton. The southern states, blessed with a climate perfect for cultivating this white gold, responded to this demand, and soon the ports of Charleston, Mobile and New Orleans thrummed with activity, as cotton bales set off on transatlantic journeys. Historian John Motley aptly noted, Cotton is king, and he waves his scepter not only over these 33 states, but over the island of Great Britain and over continental Europe. And truly, by the 1830s, cotton exports made up nearly two-thirds of all U.S. exports. But for all its global dominion, the economics of cotton was bound inextricably to the darkest corner of the American story, slavery. Senator James Henry Hammond of South Carolina, a staunch defender of the Southern way of life, once proclaimed in Congress, without the firing of a gun, without drawing a sword, should they, northern states, make war upon us, we could bring the whole world to our feet. What would happen if no cotton was furnished for three years? Hammond's statement, while grandiose, wasn't devoid of truth. Cotton's profitability was anchored in the cruel efficiency of slave labor. As planters expanded their holdings, the demand for enslaved people surged. By 1860, there were approximately four million enslaved individuals in the US, a majority laboring in the cotton fields. It wasn't just the large plantation owners who were entwined in this economy. Bankers in New York, ship owners in New England, and textile mill operators across the pond in Liverpool all had stakes in this southern enterprise. Curiously, the fervor of cotton fever manifested in diverse ways. Towns like Cottonwood, Cottondale and Cotton Plant sprang up across the south, bearing testament to the crop's influence. One captivating anecdote from this era tells of a meeting between a southern planter and an English merchant. When the Englishman remarked on the south's dependency on cotton, the planter, with a twinkle in his eye, drew forth a cotton seed from his pocket and declared, Sir, in this seed lies more power than in all the crowns of Europe. Such was the allure and audacity of those under King Cotton's rule. The journals of Solomon Northup, a free black man kidnapped and sold into slavery, provide a harrowing glimpse into this era. In 12 years a slave, Northup described the gruelling labour. The hands are required to be in the cotton field as soon as it is light in the morning, and they do not leave the field until it is too dark to see. His words, echoing across time, provide a stark counterpoint to the gleaming tales of prosperity. As the Civil War loomed, the South's confidence was bolstered by their cotton-driven economic power. Yet, as history would reveal, while cotton was king, it was a monarch atop a fragile throne, its foundations resting on exploitation and inequity. The winds of change, fueled by moral, political and economic factors, would soon challenge the reign of King Cotton, setting the nation on a turbulent path. In the shadow of white gold, lives lived beneath the cotton sun. The southern sun, with its unyielding intensity, cast long shadows across vast cotton fields, mirroring the stark contrasts of the antebellum south. Amidst the endless rows of burgeoning cotton, the lives of enslaved individuals unfolded, marked by sweat, songs, sorrow, and fleeting moments of resilience. Imagine a day commencing long before the roosters crow, as the first whispers of dawn brush against the horizon. On sprawling estates like Monticello, owned by Thomas Jefferson, or the grand plantations of Mississippi's Natchez district, enslaved individuals were roused by the overseer's call or the foreman's horn. This heralded the beginning of their ceaseless labor, their fingers swiftly darting between thorny plants, 
pulling cotton blooms and stuffing them into sacks that seemed to grow heavier with each passing hour. Yet, cotton was not the sole domain of their toils. Enslaved craftsmen, like those on James Madison's Montpelier estate, worked as blacksmiths, carpenters, or masons. Enslaved women, in addition to fieldwork, bore the added responsibilities of cooking, sewing, and often nursing the children of the plantation owners. Their dual roles highlighted the pervasive reach of the institution into every crevice of their lives. In her poignant narrative, Harriet Jacobs, an enslaved woman who later secured her freedom, wrote of the ceaseless toll of her days. The beautiful spring came, and when nature resumes her loveliness, the human soul is apt to revive also. Yet, for Jacobs and countless others, this revival was short-lived, as the weight of bondage pressed ever heavily. Despite the stark oppression, moments of humanity flickered. Between the labor and under-watchful eyes, whispers of stories from African homelands, tales of hope and muted laughter found their way. Spirituals infused with messages and codes for escape often filled the air. Songs like Steal Away to Jesus or Swing Low Sweet Chariot held dual meanings, offering solace and signaling plans for freedom. The evening hours brought scant relief. The enslaved returned to their quarters, often cramped rudimentary cabins made of logs with dirt floors. Here, amidst the fatigue, families would gather. Shared meals, tales and the warmth of kin offered a brief respite. On some plantations, Saturday nights were marked by dances and celebrations, with rhythms echoing ancestral memories. However, Sundays, considered a day of rest, were not always free. Enslaved individuals might have to tend to personal gardens, a crucial supplement to the meagre rations provided. Anecdotes from this era are replete with tales of resilience. On a plantation in Georgia, an enslaved man named Cato fashioned a makeshift violin from old cigar boxes. His melodies, sources say, brought fleeting moments of joy to his community, proving that even in the direst circumstances, creativity could flourish. Curiously, some plantations, in a bid to project a facade of benevolence, allowed enslaved individuals to earn money by selling excess produce or handcrafted items at local markets. But this paled in comparison to the systemic dehumanization they endured. There's a haunting account from Charles Ball, who penned his life as an enslaved man. Recollecting his first day on a cotton plantation, he remarked, I was now, for the first time, made to comprehend the full meaning of the words slave, master. His narrative underscores the vast chasm between the world of the enslaved and that of their oppressors. On the canvas of this era, stories of endurance stand out. Figures like Denmark Vesey, who planned a massive but ultimately thwarted rebellion in Charleston, or Sojourner Truth, who, after securing her freedom, championed the cause of abolition, showcased the indomitable spirit of the enslaved. While the vast cotton fields bore witness to innumerable sorrows, they also held memories of quiet defiance, dreams of liberty, and the indelible spirit of those who walked in the shadow of white gold. Echoes of home, unbroken spirits in shackled times, the mid-18th century southern breeze, perfumed by magnolias, carried within it more than just the scent of flowers. It bore melodies, stories and traditions that spanned an ocean, an enduring testament to the resilience of the enslaved. In the confines of their forced homes, amidst the verdant cotton fields and stark cabins, enslaved Africans spun a cultural mosaic that bridged the memories of distant lands with the immediacy of their present. Underneath the sprawling oak trees of South Carolina plantations, as the sun dipped below the horizon, one could hear the rhythmic beats of drums reminiscent of ancient African rituals. These beats weren't just music, but coded messages, a discreet language that echoed the spirit of resistance. Such communication networks were vital in spreading news and sharing hope, often under the vigilant eyes of overseers. Central to the cultural preservation was the role of the griot, or storyteller. Enslaved individuals like Venture Smith, who in 1798 documented his life's journey from Africa to American plantations, played an instrumental role in preserving these tales. His narratives, intertwined with memories of African kingdoms and poignant moments of his life in bondage, became a beacon for generations. As the decades unfolded, the mingling of various African tribes on plantations 
gave birth to unique linguistic blends. The Gullah Geechee community, ensconced on the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina, carved a distinct Creole language, a harmonious blend of English and African dialects. Their culture, a rich tapestry of African customs interwoven with New World realities, thrived despite their oppressive circumstances. Songs, dances, and even culinary delights like okra stew told tales of perseverance and adaptation. Amidst this tapestry of evolving cultural norms, the importance of family remained unshaken. In the face of forced separations and auctions, enslaved individuals sought to rebuild family structures, designating kinship roles even among unrelated individuals. Terms like auntie or uncle weren't always biological. They were symbols of respect, endearment and familial bonds. Anecdotes of mothers like Margaret Garner choosing to take the lives of their children rather than subject them to the shackles of slavery are painful reminders of the depth of these bonds. Religion, too, served as a refuge. Christianity, introduced to the enslaved, was embraced and molded to fit their narratives. Spirituals, those soul-stirring songs sung in fields or during gatherings, were more than hymns. Anecdotes suggest that on many plantations, Sundays, often the only rest day, became a hub of cultural expressions. Places like Congo Square in New Orleans by the early 19th century transformed into sites of celebration. Here, amidst the beats of drums and the rhythmic dance steps, a semblance of freedom was tasted, if only momentarily. Curiosities, too, found their place within these cultural expressions. Jack-o'-lanterns, a staple of American Halloween traditions, have tales linking them to African folklore. Stories whispered among the enslaved spoke of restless spirits trapped in lanterns, lighting the way for wandering souls. Famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass, himself once enslaved, remarked, If there is no struggle, there is no progress. These words resonated deeply within the lives of the enslaved. Their struggle wasn't just against chains and whips, but against the erasure of their identities. Through melodies, stories, rituals, and an indomitable spirit, they not only preserved their heritage, but also enriched the cultural milieu of a nation. In the shadow of the Iron Collar, powers grasp on the plantation. The vast expanses of southern plantations, with their sprawling cotton fields and grand mansions, painted an idyllic scene. Yet, lurking beneath this facade was an intricate web of control, a machinery of domination devised to crush the spirit of those deemed property. The sounds of clinking chains, muffled cries, and overseers' commands reverberated, echoing the lengths to which power structures went to maintain their stranglehold. As dawn broke over places like Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's estate, or the sprawling grounds of the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, one could spot enslaved individuals with iron collars around their necks. These weren't mere accessories. They were grim tokens of attempted subjugation, designed to mark runaways or those perceived as rebellious. Each weighty step under the burden of these collars told tales of defiance and the cruel attempts to quell it. The slave patrols, dating back to the early 18th century in South Carolina and later adopted across the southern states, roamed the countryside. Their primary purpose was twofold, to deter insurrections and to capture runaways. The mere sight of these patrollers, often armed and on horseback, served as a constant reminder to the enslaved of their place in this societal construct. Physical punishments, as chilling as they were, only formed a part of this tapestry of terror. The whipping post, a dreaded fixture in many plantations, bore witness to countless acts of brutality. Each lash that descended upon the back of an enslaved individual was an attempt to break their spirit, to reduce them to mere chattel. But as the story of Gordon, an enslaved man whose scarred back was photographed in 1863 goes, these marks often became symbols of resilience. His image, which circulated widely in the North, illuminated the brutalities of slavery and bolstered the abolitionist cause. Beyond the whip, the power wielders had other sinister tools in their arsenal. Family separations, a common occurrence during auctions, became instruments of psychological torture. Mothers torn from children, husbands from wives. The spectre of such separations loomed large, ensuring compliance born out of the fear of loss. 
Intriguingly, not all methods were overt in their cruelty. The system also wielded religion as a tool, contorting biblical narratives to justify servitude. Passages preaching obedience to masters were emphasized, crafting a version of Christianity that sought to suppress any seeds of rebellion. The likes of Nat Turner, however, turned this on its head. Turner, who led a violent rebellion in 1831, claimed divine visions as his motivation, upending the very narrative that sought to subdue him. Curiosities abound in these dark tales of control. One such oddity was the Negro Dog, a breed cultivated specifically to track down runaways. These dogs, often accompanied by their patroller masters, added another layer to the culture of fear. Yet tales whispered among the enslaved spoke of ingenious methods to throw these hounds off their scent, from wading through waters to using strong-smelling herbs. Harriet Jacobs, an enslaved woman who later gained her freedom, encapsulated the sheer relentlessness of this control in her writings. Describing her life in hiding, she wrote, I had a view of all that passed in the street, while myself remained unseen. Jacobs hid in a tiny attic space for seven years to escape her abusive master, her words painting a poignant picture of the lengths the enslaved went to reclaim fragments of their freedom. The methods of control on plantations weren't just shackles and chains. They were calculated moves in a sinister chess game, a blend of physical cruelty and psychological warfare. Every iron collar, patrolling group or twisted biblical passage was a move to keep the enslaved in perpetual check. Whispers in the wind, the subtle and stark defiances of the enslaved. In the heart of a Virginian summer, as cicadas hummed their age-old tunes and cotton plants swayed gently in the breeze, the landscape bore witness to acts of resistance that were as varied as they were profound. The resilience of the enslaved was not just forged in grand rebellions that echoed through history, but also in quiet acts of defiance that whispered of an indomitable spirit. Perhaps the most iconic of rebellions, the Southampton Insurrection of 1831, was spearheaded by the enigmatic Nat Turner. Driven by a blend of prophetic visions and a thirst for freedom, Turner and his band of followers ignited a revolt that sent shockwaves through the South. The insurrection, though short-lived, left behind a legacy of courage, prompting the tightening of slave codes, but also sowing seeds of abolitionist sentiments further north. Yet, not all acts of resistance were painted in the bold strokes of uprising. On the sprawling rice plantations of South Carolina, enslaved workers often feigned ignorance, tactically slowing down work or subtly sabotaging equipment. These covert methods, though seemingly inconspicuous, were poignant acts of protest, a silent declaration that their spirits weren't entirely tamed. As the humid nights descended upon the Mississippi Delta, tales of haints and spirits were often shared among the enslaved. These tales, more than just ghost stories, served dual purposes. They kept the curious and often superstitious overseers away from secret gatherings, and also became tools of psychological warfare, casting an aura of supernatural protection around the enslaved. The Underground Railroad, that clandestine network of safe houses and secret routes, became a beacon of hope for many. Harriet Tubman, a former enslaved woman, emerged as its most legendary conductor. Armed with an indomitable will and guided by the North Star, Tubman made 19 daring expeditions to the South, leading over 300 individuals to freedom. Her words, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves, echo the complex layers of her mission. A curious form of resistance lay in the crafting of quilts. These weren't just warm bed covers, but coded maps to freedom. Patterns like the drunkard's path or the bear's paw held within them directions and messages for those daring to escape, their designs telling tales of the routes to take or the dangers that lay ahead. Music, too, played its role in this tapestry of defiance. Spirituals sung in the fields or during clandestine gatherings often held within them coded messages. Songs like Steal Away or Wade in the Water weren't just hymns of hope. They were discreet directives, guiding escapees on their perilous journey northward. The acts of resistance also found their way into day-to-day -day life. 
Poisoning, a dangerous and desperate method, became a recourse for some. Tales circulate of overseers, or even plantation masters, succumbing to mysterious ailments after consuming food or drink, prepared by the very hands they sought to control. One cannot discuss resistance without mentioning the daring mutiny aboard the Amistad in 1839. Led by Sengbe Pie, later known as Joseph Chinque, a group of enslaved Africans took control of the ship, demanding to be sailed back to their homeland. Their subsequent trial in the US not only illuminated the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, but also nudged the nation a step closer to confronting its own complicity in the institution of slavery. Sacred dualities, the divine dance of oppressor and oppressed. Amidst the sprawling plantations, with their looming mansions and endless cotton fields, the winds carried with them not just the scent of blossoms, but also the murmurs of prayers. Religion, with its complex tapestry of beliefs, rituals and narratives, wove itself into the very fabric of the slave experience, playing contrasting roles for the slaveholder and the enslaved. The grand churches of Charleston and Savannah, with their towering steeples, often echoed with justifications for the peculiar institution of slavery. Slaveholders, guided by selective interpretations of the scriptures, found solace and validation in verses such as Ephesians 6, 5, Slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. For them, the Bible was not just a spiritual guide, but a divine endorsement, a text that painted the institution of slavery with the brush of holy righteousness. Yet these very scriptures were also turned on their heads by abolitionists like John Brown and William Lloyd Garrison, who challenged this narrative. Garrison, with his fiery speeches, often quoted verses like Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, highlighting the inherent equality preached by Christianity. While the elite mulled over theological justifications deep in the quarters of the enslaved, religion took on a distinct hue. The amalgamation of African traditions with Christian beliefs gave birth to a vibrant, soulful, and profound religious experience. The woods around plantations, often bathed in moonlight, became clandestine cathedrals where the enslaved gathered, seeking solace, strength, and sometimes guidance for rebellion. Names like Denmark Vesey resonate with this intertwining of faith and resistance. Vesey, an enslaved man in Charleston, utilized his understanding of the Bible as a rallying cry. Planning a massive rebellion in 1822, he drew parallels between the plight of the enslaved in America and the Israelites in Egypt, positioning himself as a modern-day Moses, seeking to lead his people to the promised land of freedom. Amidst these grand narratives, there were also intimate moments where faith played its role. The spirituals sung in the fields weren't just melodies to ease the pain, they were encoded messages, prayers, and tales of hope. Swing low, sweet chariot, with its hauntingly beautiful tune, spoke of the yearning for freedom, with its lyrics alluding to the biblical story of Elijah's ascent to heaven. Curiously, the waters held a special place in these religious expressions. The act of baptism, performed in hushed ceremonies by riversides, became symbolic not just of spiritual rebirth, but of a cleansing from the traumas and stains of bondage. This perhaps is echoed in the spiritual wade in the water which besides its religious undertones, carried with it advice for escaping slaves to throw tracking dogs off their scent. Religion for the enslaved wasn't just a realm of the spiritual, but also of the communal. In the dark corners of their cabins, stories of African gods and spirits merged seamlessly with Christian tales, creating a rich tapestry of folklore. These stories, passed down generations, served as a tether to their African roots, a silent act of defiance against the cultural erasure they endured. One can't discuss religion and slavery without mentioning Sojourner Truth. Born into slavery as Isabella Baumfrey, her religious visions after gaining freedom transformed her into Sojourner Truth, a fierce advocate for abolition and women's rights. Her iconic speech, Ain't I a Woman, delivered in 1851, resonates with both religious fervor and a plea for equal rights embodying the dual role of religion as both comfort 
and catalyst for change. Shadowed journeys, the silent torrents of America's inner slave trails. When the sun set on the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, with its official prohibition, it didn't mark the twilight of America's dark dalliance with slavery. Instead, like a river diverted, the currents of human commerce shifted direction, carving out new pathways that were, perhaps, even more haunting. The hustle and bustle of cities like Richmond and New Orleans was punctuated with chilling scenes. Slave pens, with their high walls and barred windows, mushroomed across these urban landscapes, housing souls waiting for their next forced voyage. Auction blocks, staged amidst courthouse squares or city centres, became theatres of human tragedy. Families torn apart, lovers separated, children whisked away from mothers. The air was thick, not only with commerce, but with stifled sobs and desperate prayers. The likes of Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, infamous slave traders, rose to prominence during this era. With their base of operations in Alexandria, Virginia, they orchestrated the forced migration of thousands, transporting them from the Upper South to the Deep South. Their business model was meticulous, ensuring that the enslaved were presentable for sales, sometimes even resorting to forced feedings or the application of iron masks to prevent them from communicating potential escapes. This domestic trade sparked an agonizing odyssey for many. The coffles, chains that bound enslaved people together in long lines, became symbols of this era. On foot, by wagon or aboard steamboats, these caravans of captive souls wove their way through America's landscapes. Stories whisper of their stops, like the notorious forks of the road market in Natchez, Mississippi. Here, amidst the trill of cicadas and the heavy southern air, transactions of immense cruelty took place, forever altering the trajectories of countless lives. Solomon Northup, a free black man who was deceitfully kidnapped into slavery, chronicled his experiences in 12 Years a Slave. In his harrowing narrative, he provides a first-hand account of this internal trade. His words, I was soon to learn what I was worth, uttered as he awaited his own sale, capture the chilling commodification of human beings. Curiously, even as this domestic trade flourished, the very rails and rivers that facilitated the movement of the enslaved became avenues of hope. The Underground Railroad, a network of safe houses and secret routes, operated in parallel, leading many to freedom. Harriet Tubman, herself a former enslaved woman, braved these routes multiple times, each journey a stark contrast to the forced migrations embodying hope amidst despair. Despite the pain, resilience bloomed. Amidst the chains and the marches, songs of resistance were birthed. The spiritual Follow the Drinking Gourd is believed to have been a coded guide for escapees, its lyrics hinting at the paths to freedom. Such musical expressions became both balm for wounds and blueprints for liberation. In this era, the city of Washington, D.C. itself became a significant hub for the domestic slave trade. Ironically, in the very shadow of the capital, where the nation's laws were crafted, pens holding the enslaved littered the landscape. This juxtaposition was not lost on many, including the British author Charles Dickens, who during his 1842 visit commented on the glaring contradiction of slavery in the heart of a nation that touted liberty. The vast economic repercussions of this trade were undeniable. Financial institutions like banks issued loans based on the value of enslaved people while insurance companies offered policies on their lives. This intertwining of human bondage with capitalist ventures was a grim reminder of how deeply slavery was embedded in the nation's economy. Silk and iron, the dual threads of enslaved women on cotton plantations. Amidst the sprawling cotton fields of the antebellum south, where white tufts rose like morning mist and endless rows painted the landscape, there thrived stories that were both tender and tumultuous. Stories woven from silk and iron, representing the fragile beauty and unyielding strength of the enslaved women who toiled within these vast expanses. The days for many of these women commenced with the crow of the rooster and the first blush of dawn. While men worked the fields, women too bore the brunt of the back-breaking labor, their hands quickly becoming calloused from the prickly embrace of cotton bowls. But the canvas of their responsibilities was more expansive 
Post the day's harvest, many found themselves engaged in domestic chores within the planters' mansions. They became the unseen machinery behind the grandeur of southern households, cooking meals, nursing white infants, sometimes at the cost of their own, and maintaining the opulent homes. Names like Harriet Jacobs become significant waypoints when traversing this terrain. In her narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Woman, Jacobs paints a vivid picture of the exploitation many enslaved women faced. Being the object of a slave master's desires was a haunting spectre, its shadow often darkening the entirety of their lives. Their beauty, instead of being a source of pride, became a peril. Jacobs herself spent seven years hidden in a tiny attic space to escape the predatory advances of her master. Yet, the labyrinth of their lives had more chambers. Motherhood, a journey of profound love, was tainted with the dread of loss. The birth of a child, instead of being a moment of pure joy, was often coloured with the anxiety that the baby might soon be ripped away and sold. Harrowing tales abound of mothers who sang lullabies that were both sweet and sorrowful, holding their children close, aware that tomorrow might bear them away. Curiosities also emerge from this landscape. Did you know that quilts often became cryptic canvases for these women? Patterns sewn onto quilts were, at times, coded messages, offering guidance to those seeking the freedom of the North via the Underground Railroad. The log cabin pattern, for instance, was believed to signify a safe house. And then there were the Kunja women, the herbalists and healers, who stood at the crossroads of African spiritual traditions and the necessities of plantation life. These women, through whispered tales, were believed to wield powers that could heal, protect, or even curse. In a world where medicine was rudimentary, their knowledge of herbs was invaluable. But their spiritual prowess also became a silent form of resistance, a defiance against the Christian narrative slaveholders employed to justify the institution of slavery. Amid these myriad stories, celebrations of resilience shimmer through. Enslaved women, despite the chains that bound them, managed to carve out spaces of autonomy, whether through secret religious gatherings, crafting intricate baskets that bore the stamp of African heritage, or by simply ensuring that their children, even if born in chains, held their heads up high. The tapestries of toil, weaving between cotton, tobacco, and sugar, as dawn broke over the American colonies and later the young United States, vast swathes of land stood testament not just to nature's bounty, but to the intricate stories of the crops they bore. Cotton, with its fluffy allure, might have become the poster child for American agriculture and slavery, but a deeper dive reveals the tales of tobacco, sugar, and rice, each with its unique symphony of challenges and systems. Whispers from the past speak of John Rolfe, an English settler in Jamestown, Virginia, who in the early 1600s introduced a sweeter strain of tobacco from the Caribbean. This golden weed would soon transform Virginia's economy, turning it into a veritable gold mine. Tobacco's allure was undeniable. Benjamin Franklin's words echo through time. A pipe of tobacco would cost me a groat, which is the third part of my weekly allowance. Such was tobacco's prominence that it wasn't just a crop, but a currency with planters paying their debts in tobacco leaves. But the cultivation of this green gold wasn't without its quirks. Unlike cotton, tobacco drained the vitality of the soil, necessitating frequent shifts in plantation grounds. And the very act of tobacco cultivation was a choreographed dance. From the careful preparation of the seedbed to the rhythmic handling of leaves to prevent bruising, tobacco demanded meticulous care. This level of detailed attention meant that while large numbers of enslaved individuals worked on tobacco plantations, the scale was often smaller than that of sprawling cotton estates. As our gaze drifts southward, the sticky sweetness of sugar beckons. The Caribbean, with its shimmering waters, was the hub of sugar production, but places like Louisiana also took up the mantle in the 18th century. Here, the process was not just about planting and harvesting, Sugar demanded a transformation. The cane, once cut, was rushed to mills where it was crushed to release its sap, which was then boiled and crystallized. This was relentless, round-the-clock work during harvest time. The saying went, sugar must not wait, 
for any delay could spoil the juice. The harsh working conditions in boiling houses, the intense heat, and the ever-present danger of accidents made sugar plantations some of the deadliest places for enslaved individuals. Curiously, a quote often misattributed to King Louis XVI's finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, states, Sugar does not grow on the banks of the Seine. This erroneous quote nevertheless encapsulates the ruthless European hunger for sugar and the indifference to the human cost of its production. Meanwhile, in the marshy lowlands of the Carolinas and Georgia, another story unfolded, that of rice. Rice cultivation was backbreaking. It required the creation of intricate dikes and water control systems. Here, knowledge was power. Enslaved Africans, particularly from regions like the Senegambia, brought with them expertise in rice cultivation. This expertise, though forcibly extracted, was invaluable, leading to an odd dynamic where enslaved rice cultivators occasionally had a bit more autonomy in their daily tasks compared to their counterparts on sugar or tobacco plantations. Cotton shadow, the tangled threads leading to war. In the heart of the antebellum south, cotton wasn't just a crop. It was a potent symbol of wealth, influence and power. Vast white oceans of cotton fields underpinned a socio-economic structure, but this very foundation began to quiver as winds of change swept across America. The early 1800s saw the United States transformed into the world's leading cotton producer, with the South dictating this narrative. Enslaved people, wrenched away from diverse African landscapes, were forced to surrender their lives to the cultivation of the white gold. The fabric of the nation was so interwoven with cotton that by the 1850s it constituted around 60% of US exports. The indomitable Harriet Beecher Stowe once wrote, the whole fabric of Southern society must be changed, and that without revolution. Such sentiments echoed louder in the North. While the South flourished, amassing wealth from cotton, the North, burgeoning with industrialization, began viewing slavery with increasing moral and economic disdain. Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852, fanned these embers, making the moral case against slavery impossible to ignore. Its depiction of the agonies faced by the enslaved turned many previously ambivalent Northerners into ardent abolitionists. Yet, as the North rallied against the institution of slavery, the South clung tighter to its peculiar institution. Southern leaders, like Senator John C. Calhoun, staunchly defended slavery, declaring it a positive good for both black and white members of Southern society. Cotton, they believed, was king, and with Europe's unquenchable thirst for it, they felt invincible. A series of events further strained the fabric of the nation. The Missouri Compromise of 1820, for instance, was a delicate dance to maintain a balance of power, admitting Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. However, the fragile equilibrium shattered with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, allowing these territories to decide the fate of slavery by popular sovereignty. The result? Bleeding Kansas, a violent prelude to the war as pro- and anti-slavery factions clashed. One can't meander through this era without a nod to the likes of John Brown, a fervent abolitionist who believed he was divinely chosen to end slavery. His raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, intended to ignite a slave rebellion, didn't go as planned, yet it intensified the country's polarized sentiments earning Brown both vilification as a madman and veneration as a martyr. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 was perhaps the final knot in the unraveling thread. While he initially promised not to interfere with slavery where it existed, the South, viewing him as an abolitionist threat, responded with secession, leading the nation down a path of inevitable conflict. Curiously, during these tumultuous times, European nations observed America's internal strife with bated breath. Britain, particularly, was caught in a conundrum. Despite its dependence on southern cotton for its booming textile industry, the British public, having outlawed slavery in their empire in 1833, leaned heavily against the Confederacy. An anecdote tells of Lincoln cleverly sending a consignment of cotton to Britain during the war, signalling that the North could supply them 
hence dissuading Britain from supporting the Confederacy. Echoes of the fields, remembering the cotton legacy. In the tapestry of American history, the cotton plantations stand as stark reminders of an era soaked in the sweat and tears of countless souls. The tendrils of these bygone days have reached into our modern world, weaving themselves into the fabric of our collective consciousness. But how have the stories of these fields and the people who worked them been carried forth into our times? One might say that the South wears its history like an old garment, with every patchwork telling tales both bitter and sweet. As Faulkner quipped, the past is never dead, it's not even past. This resonates deeply, especially when we traverse the grounds of plantations like Monticello or Boone Hall. These estates, once bustling with enslaved labor, have been transformed into historical sites their guided tours often teetering between preserving historical authenticity and sanitizing the harsh realities for the sake of palatability. Post-Civil War, as the South grappled with its defeated pride, there arose a curious cultural phenomenon, the Lost Cause narrative. This romanticized the antebellum South, painting plantation life as a genteel and harmonious society. Scarlett O'Hara, with her fiery spirit in Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, became the poster girl for this revisionist tale. Such narratives were not harmless historical flirtations. They played a pivotal role in how the horrors of the plantation era were downplayed or downright ignored. 20th century America saw seismic shifts in its societal landscapes, with the civil rights movement of the 1960s emerging as a pivotal epoch. Leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. invoked the memory of slavery in their impassioned pleas for equality. We've come to our nation's capital to cash a check, he declared in 1963, referring to the unfulfilled promise of liberty that had been denied to the descendants of the enslaved. This era did more than just bring civil rights issues to the forefront. It catalyzed a re-examination of how the nation remembered its history. Schools became battlegrounds of this memory war. The topic of slavery, once skimmed over in textbooks, became the subject of intense scrutiny. By the turn of the 21st century, curricula were being revamped to provide a more comprehensive and unflinching look at the plantation era. Initiatives like the 1619 Project, launched by the New York Times in 2019, sought to reframe American history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at its very center. However, it's not just in classrooms that this history is being retold. Museums, like the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., have risen as beacons, shining light on stories that were once relegated to the shadows. Art, too, has played its part. Kara Walker's silhouette installations, for instance, delve into the antebellum era's complexities, provoking conversations about race, power and memory. Anecdotes from the heartland also reveal how this legacy is being confronted on personal levels. Stories circulate of families discovering old diaries or letters in dusty attics, leading to revelations about their ancestors' roles as either enslavers or the enslaved. These discoveries, often unsettling, have driven many to trace their roots, seeking both understanding and reconciliation. Yet in this journey of remembrance, there are potholes of denial and obfuscation. Debates rage over Confederate statues, with some viewing them as proud symbols of heritage and others as glaring monuments to oppression. In the vast tapestry of time, spanning from the first cotton seeds planted in early America to the Civil War's final drumbeats in 1865, we've glimpsed stories both heartrending and heroic. Picture the fields stretching endlessly each cotton ball representing not just a commodity, but a life, a struggle, a dream. Frederick Douglass once proclaimed, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. As we reflect upon the countless souls that toiled under the brutal sun, let us remember their struggles, their hopes, and the progress they forged for future generations. In their memory, let us strive to create a world built on understanding, compassion, and freedom for all.